February 13, 1950, the dawn of the Cold War. Off the west coast of Canada, U.S. Air Force bomber 075 is on a top secret mission. Deep inside the bomb bay, weaponeer Ted Schreier is arming a Mark IV nuclear weapon when the mission goes terribly wrong. Captain, we got a fire on one. Shut down the number one. Number two's on fire. Just a four foot flame coming out of that thing. Shut down engine number two. Roger. Thumbing down two. Without warning, two of its six engines erupt in flames. Inside the bomb bay, Weaponeer Schreier struggles to safe the weapon as the B-36 begins to plummet from the sky. Moments later, the bomber suffers a crippling blow as a third engine is engulfed in flames. We have three engines out. As 075 enters restricted airspace over Canada, the pilot orders his crew of 16 to prepare to abandon the crippled bomber. Crew 17, fires on engines 1, 3, and 5, ditching. Look for survivors of wreckage near Princess Royal Island. Just before midnight, the nuclear bomber disappears from the radar screen. Minutes later, the Pentagon receives the code word that a nuclear bomb has been lost. Three days later, most of the crew are rescued from Princess Royal Island on British Columbia's west coast. Among five crewmen never found is the man responsible for the bomb's safekeeping, weaponeer Ted Schreier. Official U.S. Air Force reports claim the bomber and her nuclear weapon are lost at sea. Now, more than half a century later, a leviathan of the Cold War emerges from the ice. The size of the debris field is just incredible. This is the center of where the plane was destroyed. High up in the mountains of northern British Columbia, a Canadian expedition team travels to the remote crash site of one of the U.S. military's most closely guarded secrets. What do you got? Listen, airplane 92075. The flight of 075 is the world's first broken arrow incident. We are seeing the first page of atomic weapons history being written at this moment. This is a story I've spent so much time on. There's no turning back. I want to find the truth. I want to find out what happened that night when 075 went down. Was bomber 075's Mark IV bomb armed for a nuclear detonation? Some secrets were meant never to be told. I don't think the mystery of 075 is one of them. For centuries, the native people of northern British Columbia have referred to the Kispiox Mountains as the hidden place. Here, concealed among rock and ice, is one of the most evocative stories of the Cold War. The final resting place of nuclear bomber 075, America's first broken arrow. It's a hostile world where high winds and unpredictable weather can roll in without warning. The story of bomber 075 and its lost bomb exists on the border of myth and reality. More than 50 years later, the U.S. Air Force refuses to comment about the incident. Survivors offer little about their 1950 top secret mission or the campaign of secrecy that would follow. You don't want to uh, make it possible for somebody that wanted to do damage to the, to the country to maybe have some information that they could they could use. It's just better not to talk about things like that. Well, there's still things that I can't talk about, that I won't talk about. They do not destroy the birdcage. They do not destroy Three men have spent years trying to unravel the mystery. They're convinced the bomber's Mark IV was armed with a deadly plutonium core. Each is determined to uncover what happened to the nuclear material and have joined forces 
in the hope of solving one of the U.S. military's darkest secrets. There should be bone fragments. When the Pentagon releases its first report on the incident in the late 1970s, aviation writer Dirk Scepter is one of the first to read it. The U.S. military are still withholding a number of pages to, to be released or maybe never to be released. The core was a ball of plutonium or uranium or a glycite so far. Dr. John Clearwater is a Cold War historian and a leading nuclear weapons expert. Assuming that a pilot did fly the plane there. Jim Laird is the group's B-36 expert. For Laird and the rest of the team, the mystery of what happened on 075 has become an obsession. This mystery really begins at the moment where the men got the signal to bail out over Princess Royal Island in the middle of the night. What is known from Air Force documents is that before the crew parachuted from the disabled aircraft, the autopilot was set to fly the empty bomber further out to sea. But mysteriously, 075 crashed high in the mountains north of Smithers, BC, more than 200 miles in the opposite direction of its last known heading. When the bomber was found, the U.S. Air Force immediately commandeered a hangar at the Smithers Airport to stage a covert mission to the wreck site. Shrouded in secrecy, the 1954 Air Force expedition includes a three-man special operations team led by a local guide. Supplies, including a large quantity of explosives and a Geiger counter, are dropped near the crash site. On the third day, with bad weather setting in, the team retreats to a safe location and destroys the fallen bomber. This was the first time, and as far as I know, the only time the US Air Force went in to a crash site of one of their aircraft and destroyed it. Why? What were they trying to? Hide. The mystery of 075 has lasted longer than the Cold War itself, and the team has little to go on. What they do know is that a Mark IV bomb was on board the aircraft. Photographs taken of the wreckage by the Canadian military in the late 1990s also revealed detonators needed for exploding a nuclear device. But the most significant evidence is the birdcage a lead-lined container specifically used to carry the bomb's deadly plutonium core. For the team, they are facts that suggest the bomb was armed for a nuclear detonation. What happened during the world's first Broken Arrow incident? Was the Mark IV armed for a nuclear detonation before it crashed? Or did someone try to fly the aircraft and its atomic bomb to safety? Uncovering the truth won't be easy. And although the team may not agree about what happened to 075 and its lost nuke, they agree there is only one way to find out. Far from civilization and accessible only by helicopter, the trip to the remote site of the first broken arrow isn't an easy one. Strewn among ice and jagged rocks, the remains of 075 is a garden of twisted steel. Hey Dirk, I think I found a couple of the cylinder heads here. They look like they've gone through intense heat. From their research, they believe 075 landed nearly intact before being blown up by the Air Force Special Operations Team in 1954. The size of the debris field is just incredible. You look up on the hill there, and there's a propeller up on the hill, and it's so far away from us. More than 100 meters from the bomber's impact site, they find their first clue. These big parts, heavy parts, are way down the crash site. To blow an engine this size apart, they must have used mega, mega explosives in 54. The team is puzzled by the degree of devastation and wonder why the Air Force destroyed an aircraft lost. Okay. 
in such a desolate place. It looks to me as though the entire aircraft has been rolled, or when the detonations took place, it flipped the entire section on its back. Might be just the, this section, this aft section of the fuselage that flipped over. It's upside down. The whole plane looks to be upside down. Although the destruction of the bomber would have required large quantities of TNT, there is no end to the amount of unused explosives scattered around the wreckage. Were the explosions in 1954 so massive as to throw you know, a massive aircraft onto its back? I don't know what happened here. I think we're in a bit of luck, Jim. Right, right under here, there's the original painting number six on the forward part of the nacelle here. This would have been the extreme outboard engine on the right-hand side of the aircraft. Which was running. Yes, it was, and it was, it's now almost in the bomb bay. So how did it get here? This is the co-pilot's position here in the cockpit. 075's compass is the only piece of equipment still recognizable from the flight deck. An actual but behind the cockpit, instrument. they find a clue that only deepens the mystery. And it does look to me like there's a hole here, like a big explosion took place in this spot. But what kind of explosion? In their search for the answers, the expedition will have only three days to investigate the shattered remains of the largest bomber ever built. Resurrected at the end of World War II, rising Cold War tensions gave new life to the concept of an intercontinental bomber. What emerged from the drafting tables of the Consolidated Aircraft Company was a plane from the pages of a Jules Verne novel. Designated the B-36, the Titanic bomber may not have been designed to start a war, but it could unleash the destructive power to finish one. With a wingspan nearly as long as a football field, its body seemed to stretch on forever. Its enormous tail rose nearly five stories, and with the capacity to hold four rail cars of fuel, the bomber could remain airborne for more than 50 hours. With a crew of 16, the aircraft's forward and rear crew compartments were separated by a bomb bay more than 80 feet in length. In full attack configuration, the B-36 could carry two atomic bombs with the destructive energy of 2,000 boxcars of TNT. Getting the 200-ton bomber into the air required six piston-powered engines with propellers measuring 19 feet in diameter. Christened the Peacemaker, the Intercontinental Bomber soon became the new icon of American might. Two years after it entered service, the only thing it needed to fulfill its mission was an even more lethal atomic bomb. Even before the US dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan in 1945, scientists were hard at work designing what they described as the holy grail of nuclear weapons, the Mark IV. Like its predecessor, the Mark IV would be a fission-type weapon, like the bomb dropped on the city of Nagasaki. As big as a mid-sized car, the Mark IV was designed to be built in large numbers. It would be the world's first assembly line produced nuclear weapon. Weighing in at more than 10,000 pounds, most of the bomb's weight was made up of an inner and outer sphere of high explosives weighing nearly three tons. But the Mark IV's destructive nuclear punch would come from a plutonium core levitated within a hollow shell of uranium. Near the rear of the weapon, a cylindrical electronics package known as the X-Unit held the bomb's sophisticated firing system. Once dropped, a series of fuses would initiate the nuclear chain reaction. The X unit would then trigger detonators positioned on the face of each of the high explosive lenses. With twice the destructive power of previous bombs, the Mark IV could lay waste to the heart of any city in the world. 
radiation leaving it uninhabitable for years. After the US had shaken the world with its detonation of the first atomic weapons, the balance of nuclear power found its equilibrium. In the summer of 1949, with plans Soviet spies had stolen from the Americans, Russia detonated its first nuclear bomb. In response to the Soviet threat, the Air Force creates Strategic Air Command, or SAC. SAC's mission was simple and uncompromising. Maintain a sufficient number of B-36s capable of leaving the Soviet Union, a smoking, radiating ruin. To prepare for a potential nuclear showdown with the Soviets, SAC crews trained around the clock in full combat posture. Five years after it began its battle with the Atomic Energy Commission, the Air Force finally received its first live nuclear weapon for training. It was a Mark IV, and it was headed for Alaska to be loaded on bomber 075. As Jim Laird hikes up to the wreck on the team's second day on the mountain, he finds a new trail of clues. Looks like a hatch cover, John. It's so hard for me to imagine somebody trying to jump through a hole this small in the mid-dead of night, middle of winter. Scattered among the rocks, the first evidence of 075's flight crew. It looks like a bunch of personal gear here. Several just... boots and a, a button here. Oh, look, Jim, it's, it's, it's rank badge. I think there was probably only one person on board that this luggage could have belonged to. That would be McDonald? Lieutenant Colonel McDonald was one of the, the lucky ones. He got rescued. And the UTM coordinates... With the first archaeological permit ever issued by the government, the team will collect and catalog artifacts they hope will answer two unsettling questions. Was a plutonium core on board 075? And did Ted Schreier, the man responsible for the nuclear weapon stay on board and fly the bomber to its glacier hiding spot. There's no end to the personal effects in here, and, or the operational ones. Uh, Dirk, oxygen hose. Well, I like to get my hands on Captain Schreier's stuff. It looks like deflector sight. Hey, guys, I got one. Whoa. White parachute in perfect condition. Its silk is just as, as new. Near the pristine parachute, Scepter also finds an unused flotation device known as a May West. Without jumping to any conclusions, these two items indicate they hadn't been used and which might indicate that one of the crew members didn't jump. In an effort to determine the Peacemaker's final heading, Jim Laird is high above the wreck trying to identify an engine that rests several hundred feet from the crash site. Wait a minute. Here on this piece of the nacelle, it says engine number one. So that must mean the plane is right side up. And it came in facing east. That was the number one engine. And if I take a compass bearing back along this line, I should be able to figure out where it came from. Mm -hmm. So if we look this way through that dip beside Mount Colaget and take a bearing from here to there, towards the southwest, the heading is 075. 075. <laughs> 075. <laughs> Laird and Scepter believe this new discovery adds another piece of evidence to their theory that a crew member stayed on board 075 in an attempt to save the birdcage and its plutonium payload. Incredible burn. The birdcage, uh, which was used to carry the core, it should have been in this region. The photos, the, some of the recent photos, seem to show it in this location of wreckage. There's nothing here in the, in the area of the photographs. To Clearwater's disappointment, the birdcage used for transporting the bomb's radioactive core and the detonators for initiating the nuclear chain reaction are missing. It's a significant loss f in terms of atomic history. This is the first broken arrow. We don't have these objects. With their time on the mountain running out, it's a huge blow to the expedition. If there was a core, the danger of this cannot be underestimated. There, there's enough 
power in this one core to level any city in North America. After World War II, Ted Schreier left the Army Air Force for a job in civilian aviation. By 1946, the airline industry was beginning to boom, and the bright young pilot from Wisconsin landed a job with the newly formed American Airlines. Schreier settled into domestic life with his wife, Jean, and looked forward to a future flying passengers around the country. But less than a year later, to the couple's frustration, Ted was recalled to active duty with Strategic Air Command. Schreier was hand-picked to attend the Elite Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, where he was to be trained as a weaponeer, the crewman responsible for a B-36's nuclear payload. Fred Schreier was six when his uncle was put in charge of 075's atomic bomb. We were never told any details about the mission, what it entailed. Uh, we found out later he was the third pilot and the weaponeer. To prevent an accidental nuclear explosion, Schreier would arm the Mark IV with its nuclear core once the bomber was safely airborne. After removing the detonator mounted on the trap door, he would then extract an outer and inner sphere of the high explosives. Last to be removed was the pit plug, a seven-inch long cylinder of aluminum and depleted uranium. Schreier would then carefully insert the radioactive core once the bomb's missing components were replaced, the Mark IV would be an armed nuclear weapon and ready for war. But the bomber designed to carry the Mark IV to the target had a deadly flaw, its new engines. A fact that Captain Harold Barry and Gunner Dick Thrasher would learn on their first B-36 flight. On my very first flight, we burned an engine off and he had to have nerves of steel and and he brought that thing in as smooth a landing. It was the first landing ever made with just three engines on one side. Months later, Thrasher and Barry would be ordered to Alaska to fly a dangerous training exercise aboard another B-36, Bomber 075. The top secret mission would test the war readiness of the B-36, her crew, and SAC's first Mark IV nuclear bomb. With strict orders not to fly over Canadian airspace, nuclear bomber 075 will shadow the British Columbia coastline as it makes its way from Alaska to the U.S. mainland. Once off the coast of Washington state, 075 will head east to Great Falls, Montana, before turning south to conduct a simulated bombing run on the city of San Francisco. At a cruising speed of less than 200 miles per hour, it will take more than 20 hours for the giant B-36 to fly the 5,000-mile route before it touches down in Fort Worth, Texas. On the day of the mission, all is not well with the giant bomber. Despite severe cold and a host of mechanical problems, ground personnel are ordered to get the handicapped bomber ready for its simulated combat mission. They succeed in repairing a number of leaky fuel hoses, but 075's navigational radar is inoperable, and the doors of bomb bay number two are so badly damaged by ice they have to be wired shut. With less than an hour to take off, the order is given to load the birdcage and the Mark IV into 075's number one bomb bay. After three and a half hours of pre-flight maintenance, Gunner Dick Thrasher boards 075 with trepidation. As I was going to the airplane, I met one of the gunners that brought the airplane up, and I, I just asked what kind of shape it was in, because we, we had quite a bit of maintenance problems then. And he said, well, oh, it's okay, he said, but it won't ever make it back. In the waning Alaskan twilight, the bomber lumbers into the air and sets a course for Texas, a route that will take 075 
along the British Columbia coastline. Seven hours into the mission, 075 is halfway down the British Columbia coastline. At 11.25, the flight engineer reports that the bomber is starting to lose airspeed, when suddenly all six propellers begin surging uncontrollably. We're really starting to lose out. In the rear crew compartment, gunner Dick Thrasher reports flames trailing engine number one. Better shut her down. Shutting down one. No sooner is the fire out and the propeller feathered, but 075's situation turns from bad to worse as engine number two erupts in flames. 90 seconds after the second engine fire, the giant bomber is dealt a fatal blow. Engine number five erupts in flames. Hitting the extinguisher on engine five. In less than 10 minutes, 075 has lost three of its six engines, and the aircraft is losing altitude at more than 500 feet per minute. Full power is applied to the remaining engines, but 075 is still heavily laden with 15 hours of fuel and its five-ton nuclear bomb. At 8,000 feet, Captain Barry makes a difficult decision. He orders co-pilot Ray Whitfield to do the unthinkable, to get rid of the bomb. Roger, cycling the bomb doors. Whitfield tries to open the bomb bay doors, but they jam. To save his crew from drowning in the frigid Pacific, Barry violates his orders and turns the giant bomber east toward the Canadian mainland. After sending a final desperate message to the Air Force for help, the radio operator screws down the transmitter key to give search teams a steady radio frequency to home in on. Praying they are now safely over Princess Royal Island, Barry sets the autopilot to fly 190 degrees, a heading that will take the disabled bomber south and back out to sea. Okay, let's get out of here. At 3,500 feet and approaching stall speed, Barry gives his final order, and the crew of 17 parachute into the night. Within minutes of the incident, SAC headquarters in Omaha launches the largest search and rescue mission in Air Force history. The Canadian Armed Forces initiates Operation Bricks to assist in finding the downed crewmen. Fearful the Soviets may discover what's happened, the Canadians are told nothing of the bomber's deadly nuclear payload. The reason why they're doing this is this is the height of the Cold War. There is a nuclear weapon lost. The Russians are probably looking for it. They're paranoid. So why would they tell the Canadians anything? Hindered by a winter storm, the first two days of the search proved futile. A Coast Guard flying boat equipped with high-powered loudspeakers flies over Princess Royal Island, broadcasting the American national anthem and the message, don't give up hope, we are still looking for you. When the crew is found three days later, Jean Schreier receives an initial report that her husband Ted is among 12 men rescued. Nearly a month after the incident, the search is scaled back. After parachuting from the crippled bomber, the Air Force concludes the five missing crewmen drowned after landing in the Pacific. There is no trace of bomber 075. When the 12 survivors return home, they are swarmed by joyous family members and a horde of newspaper and radio reporters. Absent from the reunion is Ted Schreier, who had mistakenly been reported as rescued. Of the five missing crew members, four of them had streets named after them at the Fort Worth Air Force Base, except the fifth, the weaponeer, the man who was in charge of the bomb, Captain Schreier. When portions of the investigation are released by the U.S. Air Force two decades later, they reveal clues about what they may have already known about the fate of the missing bomber. During the Board of Inquiry, they only single out one of the missing crewmen, asking, did the weaponeer and third pilot, Captain Schreier, jump? No one seen him bail out. No one could testify that they seen him bail out. With its carburetors subjected to prolonged sub-zero air temperatures, the Air Force Board of Inquiry determines the engine fires were caused by severe carburetor icing. 
with half of its engines out, the crew is left with only one option. The next thing I remember was Barry, and he told us to get ready to bail out. But he says, first we got to go out over water and get rid of this weapon. Unable to fully open the bomb bay, co-pilot Ray Whitfield ordered the weapon to be dropped through the partially retracted doors. I wanted to get rid of it and blow it because at the time the Russians didn't have the bomb and I could just see a sub fishing it up off the bottom. In 1950, the U.S. Air Force releases its only statement on the incident, claiming there was no plutonium core in the Mark IV when it was jettisoned and detonated over the Pacific less than 30 miles from the Canadian mainland. If the plutonium core was in the bomb, Schreier may have averted a nuclear explosion by removing one of the detonators or one of the bomb's high explosive lenses. Even if there's no plutonium core on this weapon, there is still enough depleted uranium in this Mark IV to create the world's first dirty bomb. Never told of the bomb's existence, Canadian search teams scoured the BC coastline unaware of the potential for radioactive fallout. With a summer storm approaching, the team's final day on the mountain will be their last chance to uncover any new evidence. What's that, John? It's as though it's a, a kind of bomb rack, but it's not big enough or heavy enough for the Mark IV that we're looking for. But if you follow the wreckage that way, this should be something further up. Oh, oh, there's there's a clasp here. This was a heavy one. It could have been used for an atomic bomb. This is this is the huge chain winch for loading in a Mark III or a Mark IV. I think we have found the top of bomb bay number one. It looks like it's been melted along with this large incinerated area around us. And you can see there's just incredible destruction here from heat. It's just been melted into slag. There's nothing left here at all. Laird scans for radiation around the crater. There's something here that's a bit lively. Not too, too hot, but definitely above background. Boy, that must have been a very intense heat. This is the center of where the plane was destroyed. Yeah, but it also looks like sections were ripped away by an explosion. The whole assembly, the shackle, the four sway braces, the massive size of it says to me that this has to be the item that held the Mark IV atomic bomb. As heavy rains move in and shroud 075 in the clouds, Scepter and Clearwater descend into the valley below and make an unexpected discovery. They find a camp they believe was used in 1954 by the U.S. Air Force Special Operations Team which destroyed the fallen bomber. Here's the point at which all of the cables yep. attached for the parachute. Littered across the site are dozens of objects ranging from food tins and cargo boxes to grenade pins. Oh, lots more cans here, cans everywhere. Hey, look at this. Hunter Simpson's cup. Haggis used to be pretty well the only restaurant at the time in Smithers. And I'm, I'm sure this is the final evidence. Hunter Simpson was on this trip, right in this camp here. Newspaper accounts of the day name local guide Hunter Simpson as the only civilian witness to the Air Force's mission to destroy 075. But Simpson, who died in 1972, remained silent about the covert operation. Unwilling to give up their search for new evidence, the team spends their last hour before nightfall on the ridge above the wreck. This uh, looks like part of the ray dome, you know, it's same piece. Located near the nose of the aircraft, they find the shattered housing of the bomber's radar. The ray dome was the, the part of the aircraft that would hit first, probably hit right here on the top of this little ridge. It's here where Dirk Scepter believes Ted Schreier made his last valiant effort to save 075. I'm not sure what happened, whether he was actually trying to land here or whether he just lost it. There's no way he could clear that. It's several thousand feet higher than this pass. So he was doomed either way. 
On their descent down the glacier that once entombed the nuclear bomber, Dirk Scepter finds the clue he hopes will prove that someone was at the controls of 075 when it crashed. Finally, uh, some bones or bone fragments. I'm not even sure whether there is enough uh, DNA left in uh, these bones to make a p positive identification. Uh, only uh, pathologists will be able to tell uh, whether these are possibly Captain Schreier's bones. I can't be sure exactly what happened to the bomb, but a great effort was made to destroy bomb bay number one where it was originally held. Everything was blown up. What wasn't incinerated was melted into tiny pools of metal. Everything is destroyed. The evidence is gone now. In the weeks following the expedition, John Clearwater finds the person who illegally removed the birdcage from the crash site in 1998. Within days of Clearwater's discovery, the U.S. Defense Threat Reduction Agency recovers the container for transporting the bomb's plutonium core from a treasure hunter in the eastern United States. Tasked with the role of safeguarding the U.S. from weapons of mass destruction, the agency releases no official report on the incident. If this is just an empty container, why the continued secrecy? We may never know if there was a core inside this birdcage because the Air Force and U.S. government have refused comment and shut the door on this case. Forensic analysis of the bones recovered by Dirk Scepter turn out not to be human. But as the door begins to close on his theory that Weaponeer Schreier may have died on the mountain, some intriguing new evidence arises. He uncovers military and civilian reports from Canadian and U.S. sources that document a series of radio transmissions. Transmissions he believes were sent by someone who stayed on board 075 after the rest of the crew bailed out. This aircraft changed 180 degrees direction. It gained at least 3,000 feet in elevation. It flew over mountain ranges. Somebody was at the controls of this aircraft. Armed with new evidence, eyewitness reports and U.S. Air Force documents, the team has reconstructed what they believe happened that winter's night in February of 1950. From the ground on Princess Royal Island, the crew looks up and sees the plane turn around 180 degrees and fly back north. The last person to see the plane was Reverend Kinley in New Ianch at about 2 o'clock in the morning. From here, the plane may have tried to fly south into an abandoned airstrip on the Skeena River, possibly couldn't put in because of bad weather, eventually crashing to the north. When you add up the length of this route with a minimum flying speed of 150 miles an hour, what do you get? Three hours, exactly the same duration as the radio transmissions. If he stayed on board, what was he trying to save? What was worth risking his life, certainly not the aircraft. There must have been something else. Is it possible that the one crew member responsible for the mission's nuclear weapon tried to save the crippled bomber? There's only one reason for Captain Schreier to remain on board. For whatever reason, they couldn't drop the weapon. So to prevent a radiological disaster, he takes the plane and turns it around and heads back to Alaska. Schreier makes a final course change setting his compass to 075 degrees, a heading that will take him directly into northern BC and the towering Kispiox Mountains. By this time, he's only 50 miles from the Alaska border. For some reason, he can no longer keep the plane in the air. The only thing that's left for him to do is to look for the best place to make an emergency landing. At six minutes to three, Schreier sends one last voice transmission. This is Baker 36, aircraft 
just before 3 a.m. 075's radio goes silent. The bomber will remain here, undetected, for the next four years. When the U.S. Special Operations Team dropped all these explosives and supplies in there in 1954, why did they include a Geiger counter? If they want us to believe that the bomb had been dropped over the ocean. There may really have been a live atomic weapon sitting up in the mountains in British Columbia, unknown and untouched for four years. They knew when the aircraft crashed, the bomb was on board. When the team goes in, their mission is not to blow up the aircraft. Their mission is threefold. To recover the core, they took the remains of Captain Schreier and they blew up the bomb and were gone. But John Clearwater suggests there may be another, far more frightening possibility. Maybe the simplest explanation for all the secrecy is that the crew of 075 dropped their Mark IV and there was a nuclear explosion out over the Pacific Ocean and no one would have ever known that it happened. Although five of 075's crew are never found, two years after the plane disappeared, a fisherman recovers the remains of a human foot near Princess Royal Island. In 2002, the bones are exhumed from their military grave. The Shriers, along with the families of the other missing men, are asked to provide blood samples. But after forensic analysis of the remains, the US military reports they are unable to extract the DNA needed for identification. Within months of the mishap, many of 075's crew, including co-pilot Ray Whitfield, leave the Air Force. Among those who stay in the service are gunner Dick Thrasher and pilot Harold Barry. A year after their harrowing experience aboard Bomber 075, they are reunited on another training mission. Barry said, is Thrasher going with us? Well, I answered, I said, yes, Thrasher is going. This is his crew, he flies when they fly. Barry said, we're bound to have trouble. That's the last words I heard out of Barry. Hours later, Captain Barry is killed when a fighter plane crashes into the cockpit of his B-36. As the bomber disintegrates in midair, Dick Thrasher manages to jump clear before it smashes into the Oklahoma countryside. It seemed like uh, there was something wrong with Barry and I flying together because we always had trouble. By the end of the 50s, the arms race claims the B-36. True to its namesake, the Peacemaker is retired without ever dropping a single bomb in combat. Just three years after it entered service, the Mark IV is removed from the U.S. inventory and replaced by a host of more powerful nuclear weapons. Although 075's Mark IV is classified by the Pentagon as its first broken arrow, it's by no means the last. Nine months later, another crippled bomber detonates a Mark IV in a non-nuclear explosion near the town of Rimouski, Quebec. Three decades will pass before the U.S. admits to losing another 60 nuclear weapons in major accidents around the globe. Now a national heritage site, the looting of the wreckage of 075 continues, perpetuating rumors about the recovery of human remains and Ted Schreier's dog tags. For me, more than 50 years of secrecy, misdirection, and misinformation by the Pentagon can mean only one thing. Something happened that night. There's some dark secret that they don't want anyone to know about. For the families of 075's crew, they are left with only memories and more unanswered questions. I don't know why all the secrecy what could be so important. It seems like a cover-up when the families are not told what happened. What harm would it do to open the books and supply us with answers to the questions of what really happened 50 years ago? 
Like the remains of bomber 075 concealed under deep winter snows, the truth about what happened that night to her missing crew and the world's first lost nuclear weapon may remain hidden forever. <laughs>